Welcome everyone to Beauty in the Surgeon podcast. I'm Amy. I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner, and I'm joined today, as always, by my ubiquitous yes, I'm everywhere. co-host. I'm everywhere. Dr. Jason Martin. He's a board-certified yes. plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Dr. Mm -hmm. Martin, how you doing? Doing very good. Good. We have a really great topic today, which we've talked a lot about before. So we're going to talk about breast augmentation today. And I was trying to think of ways I could like mix it up. So even if you've listened to our previous episodes about breast augmentation, I think you'll still find a lot of value in this one because I've tried to approach it from like a totally different I don't know, like overview. So it's two parts. This is part one. There'll be part two. We're going to cover everything from the stats because I love talking about statistics all the way to like post-op and risks and how to choose a surgeon. We're going to kind of cover everything. So this is like um, back in the day when people used to read and there would be like pamphlets. I don't even know what that's all right? about. Right. This is your. This is your You're audio. About in caves yes. when they would paint on the walls. All the rocks. Yeah. On the what was that like Moses of the Ten Commandments? Yeah. So, it's so funny. I'm always on Twitter, which is like, I don't know why I'm always on Twitter, but I like Twitter and, and that's reading. Right. Mm -hmm. But like the, the the posts that I'm most drawn to are the ones with videos on it. And I'm like, I'm just no better than anyone else. That's right. So if you would like to watch the video that goes along with this, if you are a listener and you want to watch because there is a video that goes with this, you can find that on YouTube at Jason Martin MD. Right. You can also find us. Uh, here's all of our social media handles. Beauty and the Surgeon podcast everywhere. You can also leave us a voicemail. Someone actually, oh man. So we had our uh, Stuff We're Into episode a few months ago and I've had a bunch of people reach out to me to get the Balance app. So definitely go back and listen to that one and find out about what you need to know. But people have been texting me again. So it's been great. So please send me a text 303-630-9038. All right. Should we get into this? Yes, let's go. All right. we're gonna. This is everything you need to know about breast augmentation. And again, there's timestamps. So if you want to jump to one specific thing, go for it. But this is really giving you the overview of Everything's we're not going to leave anything uncovered. No, it's all covered. All right, let's talk about the Are statistics. Covered. Wait, we're going to uncover everything. I Boom. said that wrong. Yeah. Pulling the cover off. All right. Statistics. We're still looking at statistics from 2020, even though I did get the email or the notification from... ASPS that the 2021 statistics are coming out, but they're, you know, of course, having to crunch the numbers extra hard. So uh, they've released some of the pre data, but we're still looking at 2020 data. But breast augmentation, super popular procedure, which is why we're talking about it again. Um, even given the weirdness of 2020, where it went down 30%, it's still, you know, about 200,000 was yeah, almost 300,000. Higher than I thought it would be, if you think about it. <laughs> is, yeah. Because most places, the medical facilities were shut down for an extended period of time. For elective procedures. I mean. Yeah. Well, and I mean, let's be real. In 2020, people were focused on looking at themselves in a camera on their face. So we did a lot more face procedures than body procedures yeah. in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. That was funny. Yeah. Zoom really helped our uh, facial aesthetics surgery practice. Mm -hmm. Did. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's staring at themselves. It is like really hard to stare at yourself for more than a glance, you know, because after a while you're like, oh, my God, please. Is that what I look like? You know, that's kind of the general thought process that goes along with it. Yeah, it's you're funny though, when I'm on, even still when I do Zoom calls, I don't look at myself. Like I actually slide that over so that I don't see myself. So I'm looking at the so person So that would talking. require like a technological ability to slide it over? No, it literally requires the mouse to drag the whole thing oh, over. I wish I knew that. Yeah, so I like looking at the person who's talking. I don't like staring into my own face. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. like looking at myself. I don't look at myself. You. Even just the video I did just did just a few minutes ago with a patient. Like I had myself as a tiny little thing in the lower corner, so I couldn't even see myself. Totally. Just hope I was in film. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a lot of breast augmentations are done every year. It's one of the most popular cosmetic procedures. So that's why we're that's why we talk about it a lot. We do have some great episodes, which we'll probably reference, which will all be linked below, specifically talking about uh, complications from breast augmentation, myths about breast augmentation. So we have some other great episodes where we're covering a lot in this one. There are some other things we cover in those as well. So lots of breast dogs every year. All right. Wait, can we go back real quick? Yep. So the age distribution, um, it's interesting. 40 to 54 is is pretty high. So, As it is with a lot of cosmetic procedures because people have money to pay for them. Right. I get that. But also, I mean, people think that breast augmentation sometimes is a surgery for young people. And it's not. It's really mixed with all ages. You can look at that. It's equally distributed. Yeah. From the 20s and to the 50s. Definitely the highest in the 30s. But the, yeah. the 20s and 40s to 20s and 40s are about the same. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that you don't ever stop needing surgery, as we've talked so much about before in our other breast augmentation videos. Uh, the earlier you start having surgery, the more surgeries you'll have in your lifetime. So I kind of look at each of these boxes as probably most of these people are having surgery again, yeah. which is also why I think that these two numbers are extremely similar. It'd be nice to know what the primaries are on yeah. those. Yeah. Versus and the secondary. secondary and yep. tertiary. Yeah. I mean, these are just breast dog, not breast dog with lift. So, I mean, these are people who are just having breast augmentation, I which, you. you know, you think there's probably lifts in there at some point too. Um, absolutely. And post-pregnancy changes. So, yeah. All right. Let's talk about what breast augmentation can do. 
it can make your whole life better right it can definitely improve your overall body balance image no, okay. confidence yeah. definitely can do those things so i think that yeah. like in a macro level looking at breast augmentation it definitely can more balance it can balance out your body mm -hmm. right so top to bottom top, balance. yeah mm -hmm. and i think that's the big take home of this and secondarily in most cases it's going to make the contour a lot better um or better so I think those are the two things from my standpoint that they do, um, you know, the secondary benefit of that of helping your self image or um, symmetry, um, I think is a secondary benefit uh, that people think about, but it, it definitely is more of a balance thing from my standpoint when people come in. Yeah, well, the number one thing, they increase the size of your breasts. I mean, what, yeah. do breast aug what does the breast augmentation do? It makes your breast bigger, um, fuller, more projection, you know, all, I mean, and in some cases, someone just needs some fullness, just needs some projection, but, it doesn't necessarily mean that your breasts are going to be a lot bigger in the end. It could just be giving you a little bit more stability in the breast, a little bit more projection. Doesn't mean that you're, you know, going like Dolly Parton huge. I think that's probably the misconception is that the only goal of breast augmentation is to make your breasts bigger. It might just be to make them more balanced to your overall shape to give you some symmetry. Exactly. Back. It's less common. I think that most people think to have like a unilateral breast augmentation, like that's extremely rare. I mean, I think in the 16 years we've been working together, we've without reconstruction, we've done that once. Yeah, I mean, uh, from someone who had just a completely underdeveloped breast on one side. Yeah, and we've had a, I feel like we've had a Poland syndrome. There's certain syndromes mm -hmm. that they have non developed breast on one side. Yeah. Poland syndrome, P O L A N D S, Poland syndrome uh, is one of those. Uh, but I can't remember if that patient had Poland's or not. Yeah. But there was definitely, we've had, I thought we, I think we've had two of those kind of unilateral procedures that weren't related to breast reconstruction for breast cancer. And uh, that the one you're talking about definitely did not have Poland syndrome. It was just a, a genesis or like a non-developed breast. Yeah. She also had a concurrent issue on the other side in, years later in the future, which was also interesting. Yeah. She had a very bodies odd, are weird. <laughs> odd presentation. Yeah. Continued to be odd. But I think that balance thing, which is related to volume, as you're implying, mm -hmm. is the kind of macro, but the micro part, the part that I think that really makes this surgery interesting is the contour projection implant selection and how that fits into your normal anatomy or what your presentational anatomy is. And that's the part where I think it's like really interesting and gets like fun um, to really delve into these selections. So improvement in contour, improvement in silhouette, improvement in projection, um, I think, you know, is what people ultimately want, but the, at its baseline, you're just trying to create balance in your body. If you do this naturally, non-naturally as Amy implied, you're not worrying about balance. You're right. just worrying about size, size. yeah, which, <laughs> which is just, fine. Yeah, because that's what it does. I you, mean, that you breast augmentation you. does yeah, size. It's all good. Yeah. So what can breast augmentation alone not do? Well, Amy, we've said this like a thousand times, but it can't lift the breast. Correct. Yeah, no I mean, matter what someone tells you, if you yeah. have severely drooping breasts, no amount of breast implant is going to fix that. And when you go into the office and they say, we'll just put bigger implants in, no, that doesn't fix it. No. And it will make it worse. It'll definitely make it worse. I mean, you yeah. think about long term. Even, yep. Just the weight of that implant, regardless of the plane, um, is going to make additional strain on the breast and definitely add to the droopiness. Something else that I, I didn't actually put on this slide, but that we have talked about before in our Oh, going back several years, our series about whether or not plastic surgery makes you happy. Breast augmentation has had a unique component on that. You remember that if people who struggled with depression prior to breast augmentation surgery, it actually made it a lot worse. Like their rates of depression, and that doesn't mean that the breast augmentation made it worse, but like in follow-up years, their depression definitely escalated. Yeah, at least in it the study not, we read. Yeah, it did not get better. And this was, I mean, this was looking at a broad overview of a lot of studies from a lot of different countries. So Breast augmentation will not change your life <laughs> per se. It definitely will not fix your relationships. It will not ch you know, fix those things. Like you have to be the one to fix those things, but you might feel better about fixing them with your new breasts. You could get a breast augmentation and then go to therapy. That's what I mean. <laughs> like it might give you the little boost in life, or maybe you realize that your relationship isn't worth working right. on at that point. Right. So, you know, uh, we definitely have had a lot of patients come in pre and post uh, Divorce. certain relationships. Yeah. yeah. Or and, end of relationship yeah. stuff. Yeah. Go up, go down, have their implants taken out because they didn't like them ever. Then they get them huge because their partner didn't want them big. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. Oh, we've had it all. Yes. Um, if you do 
and we'll get to the different ways you do breast augmentation, but if you do it, um, put the implant in above the muscle, it can lift the breast a little bit, and but that's only a very small amount, maybe a centimeter or so. It's in most cases not even worth it. Yeah. Uh, the benefit of that quote unquote lifting is, is not even worth it. It's not usually worth the trade off for the size of the implant you have to use. And then also when you go above the muscle, the implant show is more, you see rippling. We're talking about all of that. Yeah, I know, but mm -hmm. I'm just saying so, in general, I think it's best to tell or think in your mind that it's not going to lift your breast. If you need a lift, you need a lift. And the augmentation is there to, as we said, in a macro way, make the body balance better in a micro way or more focused way, make the contour of your breast better with or without a lift. Yeah, so it's not lifting it alone. All right. So we know what breast augmentation can and can't do. Who is a good candidate? Uh, anyone uh, over, I guess, 18. It was so. Yeah. Yep. So ideally, I mean, always with surgery, you got to be healthy enough for surgery when you're doing an elective surgery. Number yep. one, healthy enough for surgery makes you a good candidate. Having realistic expectations is something that makes someone a good or a bad candidate for surgery. Um, there, Like I said, there's things that breast dog can and can't do. If you expect that to lift your breasts, that's not going to happen. If you expect it to fix all the problems in your life, it's not going to happen. Wanting just bigger breasts because you want them, perfect. You have realistic expectations. We can do that. <laughs> Check. Yeah. I always say breast augmentation is the one surgery do that's instant gratification. Oh, yeah. Like, boom. There yeah. I mean, are. you can wait. So that's the thing. It's, it's not going to make your depression better, but it's sure, man, you can see the before oh, yeah. and after, and it's pretty awesome. Like, you know something amazing. It's happened. kind of invigorating, I'll yeah. be honest. I mean, I know, I'm sure that's short lived. After a while, you just get used to it, but like, it is, people get pretty. Yeah. Pumped up after their surgery. Well, because it's instant change. Oh, yeah. Yes. And the, most of the surgeries we do, I mean, even a face and neck lift, I mean, yeah, it's instantly different, but you're also swollen, you're bruised, you know, like breast dog's the one surgery where it's like, yeah, oh my gosh, like it is instantly what I completely, yeah, like it's good. Uh, you're also a good candidate if you have smaller breasts than you'd like, or if you have, as Dr. Martin was talking about earlier, you have underdeveloped breasts, like you've reached the age of maturity, which is going to be, in most cases for women, at least 20. 20 to 22 years old right that's why they we wait at least till 18 preferably and then um, the fda rate what's it 22 now we prefer silicone implants which we'll get into so 22 i i prefer people just to wait till 22 because yeah. um, you can still have breast growth even after 18 now oh, women absolutely. women stop developing before men do but you know you we all know someone who's i mean not that we're, this is the topic of conversation at the dinner table but their breast grew even in their late teens. Yeah, breasts, yeah. breasts continue, continue to grow. I mean, as they Not can just for, with weight fluctuates. I mean, they were yeah. developing more. Can so. get more breast tissue. Yeah. Look at men are the same way. Mm -hmm. Can develop breast tissue later in life. So can women. Like this continues to happen for a variety of reasons. Exactly. But, um, you have loss of breast volume following surgery or pregnancy. Those are great reasons to get a breast augmentation. Weight loss for sure. Yep. Uh, asymmetrical breasts. We kind of touched on that earlier. There are, it's rare that, you know, people have this condition, but there are conditions where you have one breast that is much smaller than the other. Mm-hmm. They're, it's not super. I always tell people your breasts are not twins; they're sisters, so they are not identical. <laughs> like they are, they'll be slightly different. You love your little comments. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you say that and like have that like rue smile when you do it? No, but I do tell that to a lot of patients. I mean, yeah. that's just the truth. Like no two breasts are identical. No. Like even on the same body, so you got to accept some asymmetries, but you can definitely make them more symmetrical. And then the big one: FDA or FDA approval for silicone breast implants is for women or people twenty-two years and older, and for saline it's for 18 and older and I think it's kind of, we've talked about this before like how ridiculous that is the FDA does sometimes do weird things I don't really know what the difference is because as we'll talk about these implants are very similar on the external component which is yeah. all that's touching a person it makes no sense whatever yeah. maybe it's I don't know who knows yeah it's I don't weird. know because technically 18 is um age of consent age of consent for in medicine so what what's the differentiating factor physiologically between an 18 and 22 year old? I have no idea. Yeah. But that is the FDA requirement. It's so. some FDA sh shenanigans, but it is, I mean, is what it is. What it is. is. <laughs> All right. I had that same feeling when I was growing up and, you know, your parents were like, you have to do this. I was like, well, I don't agree. And they're like, well, you don't have a choice. It is is what it is. I mean, you that's, don't have a choice, man. <laughs> that's how I feel about gravity every yeah. single day. Yeah. <laughs> Could you just stop it? <laughs> All right. Let's take a quick break. And we'll be right back. Be right back. And we're back. So now we're going to talk a little bit more. We know who's a candidate for this procedure. We know what it can and can't do, right? From a fundamental standpoint, what the surgery can do. Now we're going to talk about the nitty gritty. We're going to talk about picking a surgeon, pre and post op stuff, and all of that. So we just had a great episode 
two episodes ago, New Beauty. It's uh, labeled as 150. <laughs> it is our 150th episode. We talk about the uh, New Beauty Guide to Choosing a Surgeon. We also have one from a long time ago that talks about the importance of board certification and another one about choosing your surgeon. So it's really important. Number one for us, obviously, board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. This guy right here with two thumbs. <laughs> this guy. So and, and as a reminder, there is no American Board of Medical Specialties recognized as a certifying board with cosmetic surgery in its name. So what you're looking for is a doctor who is board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery or the Royal College of Plastic Surgeons, Royal College of Surgeons in Canada. So Amy, why does that matter? Well, we go into this in detail in our previous episodes. It, it matters a lot. It matters about training. It matters about ethics. Uh, there's so many really important factors to consider when choosing and a surgeon. And ongoing education yep. or CME stuff. So. You know, it follows FDA requirements. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I am held accountable for both my behavior, my actions, my practice, my acumen, and that's ongoing. That never stops throughout my career. And it's kind of annoying, to be honest with you. It's a lot of work. Right now, I'm doing the in-service test on topics that I haven't even addressed since last training. Last year's in-service? No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. Since last year, I did the in-service, but like since training, so... These are things that keep my mind going and keep me updated on what's going on in plastic surgery. And, uh, you know, this test is different than it was three years ago. There's more gender affirming stuff on this test. So it's always keeping you up to date. And these are just one of many things the board requires uh, for you to do over time. And if you're not part of this organization, you're part of a cosmetic surgery whatever those are they don't they're not going to have the uh, educational you know and practice related upkeep it's not going to happen and those things are definitively important secondly well and you had to meet all of the training requirements right. even before you could join this so right but the, the one thing i've been thinking about lately the secondary part of this is uh if you have to do all this rigorous stuff even after you get board certified then you're going to want to utilize that right like it's a lot of work to be a plastic surgeon to maintain it so if it was just like i went to costco and i just purchased my plastic surgery board certification no I, your cosmetic surgery or whatever yeah <laughs> i wouldn't it, I, it would i wouldn't have that same feeling i wouldn't be so driven to maximize my effort and to do everything i can and then that's the truth right because it was arduous to get there and i want to maintain it that element mentally for the surgeon is very important. You do not want to go to someone who is disregarding their their responsibilities. Well, or who just didn't do the necessary training to yeah. even get there. I mean, but at some point you could probably pick things up after you get done. Yes, you can. Uh, something else that's really important when you choose your surgeon is that their results and aesthetics match your desired outcome. You know, it's I always say the there is no more unhappy patient than a patient whose implants are too big bar none. Um, that's not something that we struggle with. We definitely see a lot of women who come to us years after they've had augmentation with other doctors and say that the moment they woke up from surgery, they felt like their implants were too big and they've hated them every day. And like, that's really sad to hear. So you wonder with that person, like, you know, did you not have this conversation with your doctor? Did you not look at their before and after pictures? But sometimes, you know, people... I love when people say things like, oh, you guys just pick the size. I'm like, no, you're doing this. Like you, I'll give you options, but this is, you know, you need to be comfortable with this. So yeah, like, it's like you're at a tapas bar and they're yeah. like, yeah, you just order everything or it's sushi, you know? Right. Like whatever looks good. Well, like what yeah, looks... whatever you want, like, I, you know, whatever you think's good. I'm like, no, it doesn't work that doesn't way. Work in that way. No. Now I, I'll guide this selection. Amy and mm -hmm. I guide this selection. I think that's really important to go to an office that gives their voice, but you need to have a voice too. Well, that's where we guide them based on what they say though. Yeah. You know, I'll first ask a patient what they, you know, what they're looking for, what they think. And, mm -hmm. you know, we'll also show them pictures of people with similar body types. And that becomes some of the most interesting conversations with a patient when they show me pictures of something. And I'm like, well, actually that to get that is a much larger implant than what we're looking at. Oh no, I don't want to be any bigger. Like, okay, well, if you want to look like that, you, you have to go to at least this size. You know, so we obviously know what it takes to get people to certain looks. Um, but if you, you know, that's where it's important to look at pictures of the patients that your doctor has done surgery on. Ask specifically, and we'll talk about this later, to see pictures of people who are your similar body type. So there was a patient that came in uh, two days ago or yesterday. I forget the days. Anyways, so she was looking at other pictures and, you know, the implants were lateralized or away from the midline. And she noticed in our pictures that the implants were... 
And some of that More she centrist. was the body. I know. And I had yeah. that conversation with her. I said, you know, this is the problem you get into because you're looking at this patient and you're relating to yourself and maybe their anatomy is totally different. But at the very least, it brought up a topic of conversation yeah. that we could tell her exactly where those implants are going to be located definitively. And she was liking what she was hearing. You know, if she was so if her breasts were so spread apart, then you wouldn't be able to put the implants really close. And uh, maybe she wouldn't want a breast augmentation in that situation. You know, that you would have to because the implants themselves have to be underneath the nipple and areola. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that is a great conversation to have with somebody, though. So, see, those are things you should be. That's why I think the pictures really do help though, when you're looking at the outcomes. And this is where it's the most important thing. Someone you feel comfortable with. I feel comfortable with you. Can you do my breast augmentation? Sure can. We're going to do that right after. Nils is going to do your anesthesia. It's going to be a good time. You don't need anesthesia. Let's do yeah. some local. Uh, yeah, someone you feel comfortable with. And we always encourage patients to get, even when they've been referred to us by a friend who's done surgery or their mom or whatever, their sister, we still say you should get other consultations yep. to make sure that your aesthetics match, that you feel comfortable with this person. Right. Like, what's their vision? What's your vision? What's your vision? Yeah. Are Does they it match up to yeah. you? Yeah. We talked about the Sadie Hawkins stance. It's just like that. Like, do you match up well with that person? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's important to, you know, get a, multiple consultations. You know, breast augmentation is a, a very commonly done procedure. I think it's pretty common for people to price shop perhaps for lesser expensive procedures. But, you know, there's really <laughs> there is no saving. There's no group bonding plastic surgery. So get somebody you feel comfortable with it. Their outcomes are what you are looking for. You know, th- this is important. It yeah. is real surgery. So, yeah. All right. Let's talk about the consultation. Oh, yeah. So at your consultation, you should be prepared to, if you haven't filled it out prior, make sure you understand your full medical history, have your current medications. You would be shocked (laughs) at the amount of people who, even after we go over their medications at their consultation, when they come in for pre-op, give me a list of additional medications that we they actually they actually time. fill it out before they come into our office yes. so and they have time at it. home and then we go over yeah. it and we still miss stuff allergies also is another one yeah. where people will be leaving though i'll hear them tell my front desk person oh yeah i break out in hives from fill in the blank and i'm like okay we just literally went over this like multiple times with you supplements you're taking all supplements you're yep. taking if in doubt just bring them with you or take pictures of the labels of all of them your smoking history your drug use previous surgeries again People love to just think that we don't need to know about other surgeries if they weren't cosmetic or if they weren't elect. I mean, if elective or insurance based, like they'll only put one. Uh, yeah, all surgeries. And if we're talking about breast augmentation, you have to look at what's your family history of breast cancer. Uh, if you're of the age, have you had a mammogram? What did that show? Do you have any risk factors for breast cancer in the future? So those things would all be covered. Mm-hmm. You'll have a breast exam. You know, the doctor should look at your breasts. Right. The only way to know, like, if you're what kind of candidate you are for this procedure is to actually see your breast. Um, they'll discuss your options, your likely outcome, give you a quote. That's the big question. How much is it going to cost? <laughs> so those things, too, people, you know, you need to see someone. Review the risks and potential complications, which we're going to go over in detail. There, there is before and after pictures. Yeah. Similar I think body types and outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. And then the question part, that's really, I mean, the discussion you have after all that stuff mm-hmm. is really where uh, the rubber hits the road. And I think it's where people start to feel very comfortable mm-hmm. with your vision or not. Maybe they disagree. So yeah. um, usually the, you know, quotes are somewhat of a deciding factor. But if that's kind of workable, then I think what your vision is, what you're thinking kind of works. And it's so interesting, too, because um, p- patients rarely know what size implant they need in terms of CCs. Yeah, which really doesn't matter. They it, shouldn't because well, it the means point. nothing. But usually I'll say, hey, can you imagine being like a larger C or you know something that's arbitrary and probably not really technical or scientific, but it usually fits with what their vision was too. And that's really great when it lines up. When I'm looking at them and I'm like, oh, this is what I think. And then they think the same thing. It's like pretty awesome. Yeah, but people a lot of times... Again, they it doesn't they don't necessarily think that way. They think they should know the CC size that they want, and that is not really helpful to anybody because the, as we talk about in a lot of our previous podcasts about implant selection, your implant is not your friend's implant is not anybody else's implant. Like the look, it's that, a snowflake. Yeah, well, but it, it's all it's based on unique. your body type, your breast tissue, yeah. how much native breast tissue you have. Uh, you know, we have patients who are you know an E cup and they have a two hundred and fifty CC implant. Right. We also have patients who would need a 500 cc implant to get them there. You know, it, it really depends on you. So don't feel like you need to know that. You should. You shouldn't know that. You should have a discussion with your surgeon, and you know that you guys figure that out together. Uh, answer any questions you have. You know, there's this is a great time. Your consultation is when you should get to ask questions. If right. you're, if this doctor doesn't give you a chance, get out of there. 
but well, get another consultation. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe not. Sorry, but, you know. sir. I'm leaving. Yeah. It might be your doctor, but you know, just those are things you should expect at your consultation. Make sure you have all your health history. You know they're getting exam, so be prepared to get at least the top half of your body undressed. Which so. is always funny because you know, of course, people get nervous and. Yeah embarrassed and all that kind of stuff. And well, or maybe they think they won't do that until the next visit, right. you know, but most places you're going to do you, that your first You have visit. to actually look at the area you're operating on. So yeah, just be prepared for that. Yep. Get your questions answered. Look at pictures. Nothing scary. It's all good. All right. So then you've made it past the consultation. You've decided this is the doctor for you. What should you plan to do at your pre-op appointment? We have a whole video where we talk about pre-op appointments, but this is specific for breast augmentation. Yeah. For sure, you're gonna be figuring out the size of the implants. So sizing in the implants, and there's different ways to do that. You can use inserts into bras. You can look at implants, put those in your bra. Um, there's 3D modeling, which I'm not a big fan of, but it works. So you can kind of get an idea of you know, what would work for you or not visually you yourself as the patient. And then the physician and their staff will also have an idea what the, what they think you need. And that's based on your measurements. You know, there's a lot of different things that come into sizing implants, which your doctor should go over with you in detail about like why these sizes are recommended. I always make sure patients know to bring a form fitting shirt with them to their pre-op appointment. So like a tank top or just something that is form fitting because it can be deceiving to look at yourself with like a, a bra on and just these implants and it, it doesn't really mean anything because as we discussed in our very first slide about this well after the statistics really breast augmentation changes the balance of your body so seeing yourself in something very form-fitting is going to give you the best idea of what to expect because in a lot of cases even though we're sizing somebody up in implants they may think like oh i need all new clothes like no your clothes will still fit you in even most cases sometimes your bra will too exactly sometimes yeah. your bra will still fit you it'll just fit you better because yeah. you'll actually fill it yeah uh so it's important to bring something that allows you to see the contours of your body with the implants plants in place, not just looking down and seeing like, oh, silicone, like, oh, great. And that's the same. That's why those 3D imaging things can be so deceiving because, yeah, you look at it, but it's not you seeing yourself. Yeah. Rotating yourself around in three dimensional mm -hmm. space. I don't I don't yeah. think really it's not the same. to how you feel like mm -hmm. you look in the mirror. Yeah. Or you how you look the clothes on. Yeah. Yeah. Or like it's like, oh, I'm looking at an avatar that has my face on it. No. Like, yeah, you make your avatar look like, however you want. It doesn't work that way yeah. with it. But it's an interesting tool. Mm -hmm. Are we going to talk about how I select implants? Is that later on or can we do that now? Um, Do you have a slide with how I select implants? Yes how, or no. Okay. Yes or no. Yes or no. <laughs> have I ever? No. Okay. There is no slide with how Dr. Martin selects implants. So go for it. Okay, good. Uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, there's three things that Amy and I look at. It's the width of your breast. Um, it's the distance from the base of your neck to your nipple and areola. And the distance from your nipple and areola down to the base of the breast. So the base of the neck to the nipple and the nipple to the base of the breast. Those are the measurements. But the width of the of your breast is really the key measurement. And from there, we just change the projection of the implant, depending on how much um, change in contour you want or how much increase in volume you want. So that's that's basically it. And it's pretty, I mean, to be honest with you, now with all the choices we have, it's a really good time to do breast augmentation. Uh, we could really get really close, I think, to what anyone's vision is, depending on what their anatomy is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many choices now. It's you see that especially when we have patients who are coming back in, you know, 10, 15 years after their primary breast dog and just we're able to size them in such a better way. So much implant. better. And we have a lot of patients yeah. like that. Now, there are patients I put the implants in before. And it's funny. So they come in, they look good. They're like, oh, we need to upgrade this. And then we do all of our new stuff and they look way better. Yeah, way better. But a lot of that <laughs> I'm like, is... I wish I would have had this implant 10 years ago. Exactly. You know, the implants just are better. They're better. They're much better. So if you've, if you've been putting off, you know, getting your implants exchanged, just know that the implant selection is better, like very much better yeah. than it used to be. So there's a lot of options. So other things to expect at your pre-op appointment, you will have your pre-op pictures taken. This means you will be mostly naked. If you go to a board certified yes. person, they'll take your pictures. Well, I think any doctor should uh, be taking your you pictures. Never know. Any board certified doctor, which is the only one you should be going to, is gonna take your pictures. People are sometimes surprised, like, oh, <laughs> oh, like, yes, today is picture day. So be prepared to have your pre-op pictures taken. I mean, we have a, d a dedicated room and you're not taking them out in the open, but it's still uncomfortable. You have bright lights, you're in a room and people are taking pictures of your naked body. Yeah. So. so they're for your medical history. And I tell this story often, we did have a patient who reached out to us probably seven, eight years after she had breast augmentation with us and asked if we had her pictures. And I said, well, of course we do, they're part of your medical record. 
So she had an unusual growth on her back that her dermatologist was questioning how long it had been there. And she had no idea because she can't see her own back. So she, that's what she wanted to see. That's so crazy. Yeah. like So there's reasons. I mean, we take pictures not because we're using them for anything other than like these are part of your medical history. When you're making a change to your body, you should have photographic evidence of, of those things. So that's why we take pre-pictures. That's why we take post-op pictures. That is the primary objective with pictures. So there will be pictures. We're going to review your health history again <laughs> send you for you get you the prescriptions you're going to need probably some pre-op labs maybe as dr martin mentioned a mammogram if you're over 40 mm -hmm. yeah medications to start to stop we're going to go over all of that with you you're going to sign consents not only the consents from the american board of plastic surgeons you're also going to sign a specific consent specific from the manufacturer of your implants that which is required by the fda is a requirement of the fda uh it's about eight pages long that you will have to initial multiple times and sign it's like buying a house so it's got that a mortgage feel to it and it does, then i have yeah. to sign it at the end and amy always gets mad at me because i forget to sign the you risk to sign them but yeah that's important so it, it you can also you should ask for copies of these consents the one thing i remind people with the Main consent. You also sign the hospital consent. So with us, you sign three different versions of consent. And then all for anesthesia different consent. So that's four. Probably. That's at the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. But the risks of surgery are the risks of surgery. So on the breast augmentation consent, it's 13 pages long. However, only the very like pa first page and a half is risks specific to breast augmentation. The whole rest of the document is the same, regardless of whether you're having a simple skin biopsy, a breast dog, a facelift, their risks of surgery, uh, your appendix taken out, like you can't get around the fact that the risks of surgery are the risks of surgery. So don't let the consents freak you out because certain death and like, you know, all those things, risks of surgery, right? The risks of this surgery specifically are going to be different than the risks of just having surgery in general <laughs> or driving to the surgery center. So, so consent forms are, are absolutely necessary and very important. And they really get good talking points for me as a surgeon with my patients. But the problem with consent forms is they don't put percentages on there, at least what we know, because they don't totally know, right? So they'll say possibility of death. I mean, the, the odds of that are so small that you're more likely to have such a rare, like, happening of getting struck by lightning or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that um, it's hard to put that in context when you're reading through that. Yeah, it's not relative risk. It's but just a risk. The surgeon should be able to tell you, is this very unlikely or is this you know what's the percentage if you get capsular contracture or scar tissue around the implant bleeding after surgery infection scar formation stuff like that so um but i think consents are some of the most important things we do well and they're important for the patient too you yeah. know, you're consenting to this so you should know what you're signing uh, final payments that's probably when you'll pay you get your prescriptions review the date and time of your surgery and answer questions and i highly encourage our patients if you have someone who's going to be with you after surgery make sure that they are aware of everything you go over to have, you know, they can come with you. Like if they have questions, make sure you answer their questions also. So bring a list, bring a list of your questions so you don't forget. Yeah. All right. What happens after pre-op? You have to prepare for recovery. And I put this right after pre-op because you should prepare for recovery before surgery. You definitely should. Re preparing for recovery while you're recovering is... On opioids, it's not going to yeah, be good. Not going to be good. And this is where, you know, having the person that you, you know, is you're going to be your caretaker for those couple of days, like make sure they're aware of these things too. Read your post-op instructions and review them with your primary caretaker. <laughs> like it is important that they know also. And it's the thing that's really important is that they know what to expect. So they're not freaking out when these things happen. Because if not, they just might be like totally freaked out when they see something that is totally normal or expected then nobody's worried. It also, our pre post-op instructions actually have a section of like when to call us immediately. If any of these things happen, like, yes, these are reasons you call us immediately. All this other stuff, probably normal. You know, you can always call us anyway, but probably normal. You should know when and where your first post-op appointment will be. It rarely happens, but it has happened a handful of times over the course of the last, you know, multiple decades of us working together that someone has gone back to the hospital <laughs> thinking that their post-op appointment is Are you there. kidding me? No, I am not. <laughs> And it's usually someone who is still medicated and their spouse or whoever, caretaker, drives them back to the hospital. Right, because the caretaker didn't know where the appointment was and his Correct. or her first inclination. They've never been to the office. Right, it's just to go to the, back to ho the hospital. hospital. Oh, my yep. God. It has happened. So know where your first, and maybe it is. Like maybe your doctor has a, a suite at the hospital. That could be the case. So know when and where your first post-op appointment will be. Get your prescriptions filled. Oh, man, this one. And pick them up. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times, like, we're so fastidious, everything we do in our office, and Amy is as type A as they get, mm -hmm. so no, nothing's slipping through the cracks. 
And I'm sitting there like, you know, sometimes we'll admit people overnight and the next morning they're like, oh, I need to get my prescriptions. Can you have Amy call those in? And I'm like, I'm pretty sure she did that. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure, you know, you don't want to beat them over the head with it, but I'm pretty sure you were told that you had to pick them up. Yeah. You know, and you, I mean, with us, with our office, you have been, but even if they didn't tell you to, just know that you should get any prescriptions filled Beforehand, prior to surgery yes. and have them on hand. You know, the the nurse who's discharging you is going to make sure that they go over your home medications with you. So if you haven't picked them up yet and you don't know what they are, I mean, that, that's a problem. Like, you need to do that. Uh, you need to fill your prescriptions. <laughs> in a lot of places, I think in most places in this country now, in the United States, if you have, they will not leave an opioid prescription sitting on the pharmacy shelf for more than seven days. So if your pre-op appointment is three three weeks before your surgery and your prescriptions are called in that day and you just don't bother picking them up for two weeks, they probably will be restocked. Yep. Your antibiotics and anything else might still be sitting there, but opioids can only sit on the shelf for a certain amount of time. So then they have to go back in the safe. <laughs> so get those filled. Find out when, when they're going to be filled and get them, pick them up. Purchase any recommended post-op things you need, garments, bras, ice packs. I highly recommend that you consider purchasing the support pillow system to facilitate better sleep or just really have in your mind how you're going to sleep because sleeping on their back at an incline is not how most right, people Right, because you can't sleep on your belly and you really can't sleep on your mm -hmm. side, which I'm a side sleeper. What are you, Nils? Back. Yeah, he'd be fine. That's what we've talked about before, facelift. Nils, Vampire. yeah. <laughs> Perfect face and neck lift candidate. What are you, yeah. well, you're, you're a side sleeper. I'm a side sleeper. Yeah. 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 Yep. I'm, I'm like straight up hugging my king size pillow. Mm -hmm. Like holding on, you know. I'll do that a little bit. Yeah. Oh, a little bit of side yeah. side. Yeah. yeah. But planning for it again, preparing for recovery. This is important because you don't want to just get home from the hospital. You're all drugged up. Then you have this person trying to help you. Like you don't even know where you're going to sleep. Like oh, you got to sleep sitting up and then you're know, sleeping on the couch. And you're really uncomfortable. And you don't sleep. So think about that ahead of time. I have a great recommendation for an awesome pillow system. Huge, hugely helpful after surgery. Think about the things you use on a daily basis. This is key for breast augmentation because we talked about T-Rex arms before. And move things, items, as close to waist level as possible. I think most people with breast augmentation think about reaching up, but they don't necessarily think about reaching down. And I'll tell you this, reaching down might feel even worse than reaching up in a lot of cases because you don't like bending over and the pressure and everything. Like getting everything as close to like waist level as possible is going to make your recovery a lot better. Like shampoo, body wash, anything in the shower that's high or low, your dishes, your cups, your favorite, anything. Get it close to waist level. This will make a huge difference in your recovery. And you won't be as reliant on somebody doing everything for you, which is nice. Right. Yeah. Plan on a few days of easy to put on clothes and shoes that you can slip into. Again, the bending over, not so great. And zip up, like button clothes. Like slip on Yeezys or something like that? Is that what you're talking about? Like Crocs. clogs? Yeah, I was in clogs, Crocs, flip-flops, <laughs> untied shoes, you know, just, yeah. you know, it is so sweet. I mean, there is honestly some of my favorite moments with patients is when they come in like right after post-op and they've got their, you know, their spouse or their sister, whoever with them. And like, they're helping them tie their shoes. And like, it just, you know, it's so sweet. Like it, it does. I mean, there is something, there's a component of recovery that like, it is nice for the person taking care of you to like, to get to do stuff for you, which is nice, but to make it easier on them, maybe don't make them tie your shoes for you. Right. You know? Think about slip-ons, zip-ups. Yeah. And Dr. Martin, you read the last one. Uh, it's very normal to be nervous, but also be excited. excited. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So my, I always tell the patients, you know, see them before surgery and they're like, oh, I'm so nervous. And I look at them in the eyes and say, I'm not nervous. Like this is the one time I feel normal, right? I know that sounds weird, that you're going to be asleep and I get to do all this stuff basically well, I hope you're not nervous. to your body. Yeah. <laughs> no, but like, I think that sometimes people need to be reassured. Yeah. Like that this is like my happy space. This is where I get into a flow state or people like us. So, I mean, it's okay to be nervous though. That's mm -hmm. normal. It's actually the patients that aren't nervous before surgery are the ones that worry me the most. Have they thought it through? Do, you know, are they bought in? Have they thought about everything, everything we talked about in terms of the risk and benefits, and long-term responsibilities? So it's not a flippant decision. And, and because of that, you're gonna be a little bit nervous. It's a yeah. lifelong decision. Um, I was thinking about this the other day, what's it equivalent to? Well, it seems like everyone gets tattoos they just don't care, but I mean, a tattoo is a definitive decision. So if, I'm a, if I was ever to get a tattoo, I would think about it pretty long and hard. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's just, it's, it's still surgery. You, you have know? a tattoo, Nils? I have lots, yeah. Remember from our hundredth episode? <laughs> what did you say to Nils when you first met him? Like you're, you're like super educated, but you got all these prison tattoos. Oh yeah. I do remember that now. <laughs> so 
sums me up in a sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're like super smart. It sum you up. Kind she got of, all these prison tattoos. You are very intelligent. but You I can see his tattoos from here. I know. It looks like he was in the Navy, like in a foreign yeah. country, and they just didn't have the proper resources to do the tattoo correctly. Over yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know, prison's more cool, yeah, I think. I, guess so, yeah. I don't know if it's cool. Yeah. But being nervous is totally normal. Like it's not it does not a sign that you're making the wrong choice. Like it's just normal. So just be nervous but also be excited because you are well prepared. Do all these things and then you'll be less nervous. All right. That that sums up uh part one. Part one. Part two, we're gonna talk about This is like Lord of the Rings. Yeah. You know? It is. Is it gonna be a trilogy part or one. a no, it's a duology. A duology. Yeah. yeah. It's a two-parter. So in part two, we'll give you a little teaser. We're going to talk about where the implants go. We're going to talk about the plane. We're going to talk about implant selection. We're also going to talk about risks and complications. We're going to talk about recovery, downtime, all that good stuff. So nice. there is good stuff to come in part two. This is the red meat we of the topic. <laughs> yes. But thank you everyone so much for listening. I have loved the texts. I mean, I know some of them are people just wanting the free balance app, which great. Like keep texting me. But we've also had some really awesome comments lately on some of our episodes and really appreciate it. Like, oh, I love the comments. Yep. And the, the listeners out there who are getting ready for surgery yeah, I love with that. other doctors, like so yeah. excited so for excited all of you. So excited for you. Yep. There's a couple that yeah. have surgeries coming up or have just had surgery and love it. Love hearing about your experiences. It helps so much. And we had a couple of patients who have left comments about their experience with surgery and it really does help everybody who listens so leave your comments below yeah i'm not a big comment person i don't usually read through them but i definitely do on this podcast because of um, i love reading they're kind of inspirational and they they actually get my juices flowing because you hear oh what they're going through they're excited things they've had done really interesting questions mm -hmm. some really really good medical questions on some of these comments which i found like so interesting yeah so we so, love it so keep it up there's our handles Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Make sure you share us with your friends. Leave us a like, a comment. We Get love ready it. for part two. I'll see you here for part two.